Um, good evening, everyone. Is everyone well? Um, it's great to bribe teenagers to come here. Jesus fed the 5,000, so we, we live by that here. But what's great, Sunday's only one part of my job. We have um, amazing youth ministry, amazing teenagers, and so across the week, uh, throughout different groups, and to know that you guys get to call this your home church is amazing. I know that you're always invited and always welcome, and the people around you, and the same for the people in this room, this is your church family, and you are welcome here. You know, you can look around and say, I am your brother and sister in Christ. For some of you, it's more encouraging than others, but you know, oh, Chloe's here. Hi, Chloe. But be encouraged. So I want to start by sharing a story. Um, I want to ask you, where do you think uh, you will be three years from now? It's not an interview. I'm not going to ask you like, you know, from five years from now, what's your five-year plan? What's your five-year goal? Where do you reckon you'll be three years from now? So the year will be 2026. Where do you think that you will be? Some of you, you might be starting university. Some of you, uh, maybe jobs. Some of you, your families might look completely different. You might have moved house. The reason why I start with this is that this exact Sunday, three years ago, was March 15th. The day might not have meant much to anyone here, but it had the most profound and lasting impacts, not of the history, not just on the history of this church, but the global church. It was my first sermon at SML. Oh, thank you. No. Back in December 2019, um, I joined in January 2020. Um, I came to visit the church um, just before joining, and I sat roughly where Mel is there and Dean. And um, I was very calmly there, and a lovely woman on the staff team at the time, Miriam, confidently bounds up to me and said, did you know that you're preaching? And I go, no. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's on, it's on March 15th, and I was like, I mean, has Andy not asked you? I mean, Andy's not here to defend himself today, but it's 100% true, and Mark will vouch for this story. Andy didn't ask me, and she said, oh, really? And I was like, yeah, no, really, why? She said, oh, yeah, it's on, a, it's on sex before marriage. And I thought, <laughs> really funny story. With the bemusement on my face, Miriam goes to the back to get the term card that we had at the time that sold you, like, future sermons. She went to get it, it said, honesty over silence, sex before marriage, Rob Salis. And it, despite this, um, however, being told that sex will marriage is my first sermon, it could be a little bit contentious, and he trusted me. I'd even been married five months and just moved in with my in-laws, so clearly not sure how qualified I was meant to be. But despite this, I finished my sermon with best man humour. I got through the whole thing, I think, pretty well. Would you agree, Mark? Yeah. And a moment that lives in my head rent-free for the rest of my days is um, Mark came up to me and said, I don't think I should lead the service. Noah at the time was in youth and doing a sex for marriage talk is awkward at the best of times. This is 100%. I'll throw you under the bus as well. And so he said, I think Andy and Fee would be the appropriate people to, to lead the service and to pray. Fee in women's health practitioner. And they were totally the right people. I, I think I get through the whole thing with best man humour. We get to the end. I walk down off, sit roughly there, and Fee gets up to pray, and word for word goes, Lord, we just pray for more sex. Realised what she said, unpicked what she had said, dug herself back out of that hole, and then we carried on with the night. But that isn't the reason why I think this had the most profound effect on the church ever, at least in my lifetime. Because after that, we sang the blessing, which is a song that we sing. It's very much sums up 2020. We sang that song. And then what happened is we closed the church doors, not to be opened. That night three years ago was the night that we started to what the effects of lockdown were going to look like. I don't think any of us anticipated, as we still are in the ripple effects of COVID-19, not living in the fear of it, but as we look at financial situations, as we look at lasting effects, we are still in the ripple of that time. I don't think any of us would have anticipated we would be here three years from now. There's a little map um, up there of like the timeline. And so like, I, no one can see it, but like on the Monday, there was a suggestion that, you know, no, um, what would have been tomorrow would have been said, hey, no, and like social gatherings, no necessary. Then by the first day, we were all sat at home waiting with anticipation. And to top off living with my in-laws, my grandmother-in-law came to live with us as well. So, and here we are three years later. And the reason why all is this to say, whenever we as humans try to have a, an insight to the future, I think we're seemingly pretty rubbish at it. Does anyone else agree? 
Like, I was told in COVID not to buy a house. It was a terrible idea. Turned out it wasn't a bad idea. But seemingly, that no matter the advice we get or the, um, that goes on, that predicting never seemingly goes that well for us humans. Let alone that if I asked you to predict, you know, would anyone like to know how you were going to die? Is that a question that anyone would like to know the answer to? Because I really wouldn't. And throughout the last few weeks, we've been going through Mark's gospel, not Mark, that's the pastor here, um, the vicar here, but um, the, one of the gospels of Mark. And we find ourselves in Mark chapter 8. So if you've got a Bible, turn it on, turn it over to Mark chapter 8. And I'm going to read to you verses 31 to 38. So I'll give you a moment to gather. Don't all rush. He then began to reach them, that the, teach them, and said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. And then he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then when he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, he said, if, if anyone who comes after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world but yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my word in this adulterous and sinful nation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him. And when he comes to the Father's glory with his holy angels... Pointless, brain-hurting theological question. I say it's pointless. Mark and I have these conversations often. Um, in Luke chapter 2, we read that Jesus is teaching the teachers in the temple. And it's one of the only times that we get depiction, like where we're told his age at 12 years old. So at 12 years old, he's teaching the teachers about what they should learn. And it made me wonder, at what age did Jesus know the role he was going to take? At what age did he understand the scriptures that he would be the fulfillment, that he was going to be the Messiah, the one who would hang on that tree? The pain and the anguish it must be for him as a young adult to know that was the role he was going to take. What about his parents? Did his parents know? That Mary and Joseph, who had cared for him as he was born to look after this baby, to escape to Egypt, to run and escape death, and to know that these things could happen? The torment for a parent to know that. I don't think I'd like to know how I'd die. I think I'd just be avoiding it all the time. But I don't think we should live in fear. But Jesus clearly knew that that's what his role to be. There are many times, um, many people claiming to be the Messiah in what would have been... Um, in the time of Galilee, people knew about revolutions and people would, um, if people were to act on them, that, that, you know, they would have died for their cause. And the disciples would have known this. And any new leader, prophet, teacher, has something fresh to say, might go that way. So when we talk about them being called, they knew the risk that was taking. As Jesus points out in this, that carry your cross. There is a cost to it. They must have known by following Jesus they were taking a risk. And this was shown at the death of Jesus' mentor, John the Baptist. They would have known that this would have been the case. And this is something that we see in Mark that Jesus begins to teach them. As a teacher that starts to, um, as I live with one, um, you can't just go straight to the answer. There's got to be like a build-up. And Jesus is teaching them that if he just goes declaring that this is what's going to happen, Without knowing some short division, you're not going to know long division. And Jesus is teaching his disciples as we go through, bit by bit. But if you're a disciple, I'm not being funny, but if you hear that, so you're telling me you're the Messiah, you're going to save the world, you're going to do that, but you're going to die. It's a bit pointless. To quote um, Charlie Brown, winning ain't everything, but losing ain't anything. 
Like, why would you want to join that team? I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be massively enthralled. And not only that, if you were Bournemouth yesterday, if the last time that you faced Liverpool that you lost 9-0, then you find out the weekend before that Man City had beat them 7-0, then you think, do you know what? We take 5-0. That would be a good day, wouldn't it? Would you agree? That is not going to be the mentality of a team or someone to get alongside, to rile anyone up. But it turns out Bournemouth won 1-0, which is a great thing. Exactly. I thought I just want to get that in there. It's a great win. That's a small victory, but not one like that is declared that is of Jesus. But I would not get on board if you know that that's going to be the outcome. There's got to be something greater. There's got to be something bigger. Mark will explain bit by bit as the chapters and he hints to the illusion what the Son of Man that will happen to him and that it will come in glory in the, the holy angels and the one will see the kingdom of God and someone standing there. He said, we will see this happen. Jesus is half quoting Daniel 7 and Zechariah 12 that God's people are to suffer at the hands of pagan enemies and be vindicated after his suffering and God will set up the kingdom at last. Jesus is both warning his followers that is how to understand his vocation and destiny as the Messiah, that we must be prepared to follow in his footsteps. Sometimes I do find it interesting that we say, oh, Christians, it's, you know, have a nice, easy, warm life, and it doesn't mean that. You can look at people's Instagram reel or see people stand up here or see people on a Sunday, and you only know a glimpse about them. Jesus didn't say, come to me and have an easy life. There is a cost to it. The cost is all of our hearts, all of our beings. And it's not just that mindset of, okay, I'll make a few minor adjustments. It's a heart transformation about who we are as people. And it's not just a one-off, it's a continuation. It's not just little things, but day by day we grow and be more like him. And he's telling his disciples how to be more like him. Christians, let's be little Christ, little Jesuses. So it got me thinking, how many times has Jesus predict his death? They're in the Gospels that there are four Gospels, three of them are known as synoptic Gospels. And they, if you, I'm not going to ask, but if anyone has cheated on a test here, if you copy it word, that was way too many people to put their arm up. Um, if you've copied on a test here, if you do it word for word, are you going to get busted? Absolutely, right? As a few teachers in the room, that's or a nod. You're going to get busted. But what happens is, is that these coincide with each other. They say the same answer, but just in slightly different ways or slightly with maybe not quite the same answer. So what happens is, is that uh, Matthew, Mark and Luke use similar sources and they come together and they coincide and they share all the same three predictions. So the first one that we read earlier from Mark 8, the first time Jesus predicts his death in detail is in Matthew 16, Mark 8 and Luke 9. Jesus fed the multitudes and he said to them, the son of man must suffer many things and he must be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law and then he'll rise again. But also Peter rebukes him. Um, he rebukes Pe Peter rebukes Jesus and Jesus rebukes Peter. And he makes it plain it was necessary for God's plan. The second time Jesus predicts his death in Matthew 17, Mark 9 and Luke 9, it occurred shortly after the transfiguration where they see, they go up to the mountain and Matthew, um, James, John and Peter were all there and they see Jesus in all of his glory, all of his stature. And then he reminds them that he's going to go. But then they are confused. They, they, we read in Mark 9 that they're scared to ask him why. They see him all of his heavenly glory, but yet he's going to die. Again, I don't want to be on the losing team. I've seen you in all of your greatness, but yet I don't want to be on the losing team. The third time we read in uh, Matthew 20, Mark 10 and Luke 18, Jesus predicts his death and he spoke to his disciples as they were heading to Jerusalem for Passover. And he reminds them that we read that God kept them from understanding and I'm not entirely sure why that is in that. Maybe if they knew, they might intervene. They might stop the plans of, that were going to happen. But they were told a third time. In John's gospel, that's slightly different. Um, it's slightly nuanced. In John chapter 12, when Jesus is um, having perfume by Mary poured on him, Judas says, you could have sold that. 
You could have got so much more money. You could have given it to the poor. And he says, yeah, but I won't be here forever. In John 13 and 14, he's speaking to his disciples. He says that I will be going away. And in Luke, John 14, he talks about the advocate and the Holy Spirit. Jesus knows that he is going. Jesus is clear in his understanding that he's not going to be around on this earth forever. But I guess why? Why would he predict his death? Why does this matter to even begin with? Because as I alluded to earlier, it was God's plan. God's plan, as we read in the very starting pages of Genesis. I mean, I learned a big word this week. I said proto evangelium. I know, right? That is a big word. I know, I didn't get an ooh for that. That's a bit sad. Literally means, thank you, it literally means first gospel. And we see this in Genesis 3 15, which give me a moment to turn there. It's really hard in a small Bible to like get it accurate, but here we go. And I'll put a mutity between you and woman and between you and your offspring and hurts. I will crush your head and I will strike your heel. But because the Bibles, this is the first prediction of a saviour. And the second part of that verse, it hints at this messianic prophet concerning a saviour. Jesus, we, I will crush. Sorry, I'll go again. His heel will be, he'll crush his head, but his heel will be struck. At the very beginning, after the fall of God has created the world, the fall of man has entered. And then afterwards, we're left as human beings to try and make it right. And we enter a time in the Old Testament where I'm so glad we don't have to do sacrifices, because I'd be here all day. And it's not quite like, you know, it's hard if you're a vegan if I'm going to say animal sacrifices. But it's a way of purifying and being, seeing for yourself like the hurt and the pain that we have caused. There needs to be a sacrifice. And God's plan wasn't always to be, clearly from the beginning pages, wasn't just to be animals, but to be greater than that. And Jesus is who we rely on. There needed to be a sacrifice. There needed to be someone to die. And Jesus took that on himself. So we don't have to. But Jesus' disciples missed it. Peter rejects it. If they knew that the fulfillment of what was coming and that they was coming back and there's an understanding, you'd hope that they're waiting. Like, let's hurry up. Let's wait for he's going to come back after Easter. But they kind of loll around a little bit. And also that the disciples were told several times that, you know, I have to die and to be aware. And if you are a parent in this room, and I can testify as the youth pastor here, that like children, you have to tell several times. The disciples need to be told several times. In Mark 8, like I said, Peter called him Satan. But... We need to grasp for ourselves why. We cost us something. And the parable that has played in my mind for about a year now that has really just struck a chord with me is written in Matthew 13. We read this. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. When we understand the worth that Jesus has given us. We want to give away everything for it. A merchant was savvy. They wouldn't just sell everything. They wouldn't just sell all their stocks and hope for the best. They wouldn't do that. That's just reckless. But he said, Jesus is worth everything. The kingdom of heaven is worth everything. And that is true. Like we read in Mark 8. However, we only get it when we realise what Jesus has done for us. We only grasp what he is worth when you realise what he's already done for us. And when you flip this parable on its head saying that God is a merchant. Well, he's a merchant, but God is the merchant in search of fine pearls. You are a fine pearl that he bankrupted heaven for. That he gave his one and only son for. So we don't have to make sacrifices anymore. 
We don't have to live in that way to be right with God. He gave us that pathway. And when we've understood that, then I want to give up everything for God. Because otherwise, when we just sing songs, we kind of like, what are we singing for? I want to give all glory and all honor and all praise to his name because he is worth it. Because he is worth everything, because he has given everything to us. And I don't think we have to wait till Easter. I don't think we have to wait to those moments. But I don't know what in the next three years is going to look like. I don't know what is there going to come, but I want to know that I've put my authority in the right place. My trust, my love, my care in what Jesus has done for me. I have faith that one day all things will be put right. I want Jesus to transform my heart. I want Jesus to transform my families. I want Jesus to transform this nation. Because I don't know what the future holds. But I know God has the best plans for each and every one of us in this room and for the rest of this world. You are a pearl. And I pray tonight that you know the value that God has put on you that he gave his one and only son as a sacrifice so we don't have to sacrifice anymore. And we might have to be told time and time and time again until we get it, but when we do, we realise it is worth so much. I'm going to bite the band up and Kate's going to just take over, but I just want to pray. And wherever you are, whatever position you are with God, I pray right now that you know that you are a pearl, that you are treasured by him and he's already done all the work. So Heavenly Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, transform our hearts, clear our minds and may we know that you're worth it. May we know the goodness in your lies in the darkest of places. Father, may we know that you are hurting knowing what the future would hold. That you are human, you walk with us, you care with us, you love us, you stand beside us and you are for us. So by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, comfort us now. Speak to us, O Lord, in your name.